Welcome to Real Talk with Reginald D. I'm your host, Reginald D. On today's episode, I have DC Glenn. DC Glenn is a famous rapper, an actor, motivational speaker, and a voiceover artist from Atlanta. He rose to fame as part of the hip hop combo group called Tad Team with the hit song, Woom, There It Is. Welcome to the show, DC Glenn. What's going on, man? Good to be Not here. Not much. Yeah. DC, the brain supreme in the house. You know it. Really appreciate you taking the time out, man, just to hang out with me for a second. I know you're busy and everything like that. I really appreciate it. I ain't never that busy to run my mouth. Let's do this. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about DC Glenn. You were born in Denver, Colorado? Or raised in Denver, I was Colorado? Born in Chicago, but we moved to Denver when I was about five years old and had an incredible childhood living in Denver, Colorado. Went to school at Sac State University. Then after I finished, came down here to Atlanta and have been in Atlanta ever since 1989. And this is the hub of everything, you know, black culture. It always has been, you know, here in DC, I would say, right? And that's what really enamored me about being in Atlanta is that back then when I first got here it was black folks living in harmony. And, but still is to this day, it's more of a mixed pot, but it's still kind of that same vibe. And, you know, things change and, you have to change with them and you have to adapt with them. And you can't wish for the old days. You know what I'm saying? You got to make the new days what you want them to be. And a lot of times people are not willing to put the work in to do that. So I'm not one of those people. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to hustle. I'm going to play offense and I'm going to get mine. That's it. So when you went to Atlanta to, I guess, visit the first time or whatever, you got a taste of it and you say, man, this is the place I need to be. Yeah, I came down Christmas time to visit Steve Rowland because he was going to the Art Institute and him and his cat named Brother Jeff took me to Magic City. And right then and there, I knew I was moving to Atlanta, <laughs> right? Uh, we we partied that for Christmas and New Year's, partied New Year's with Guy and I moved down here. And within a week, I was the head DJ at Magic City and that just changed my whole trajectory. And it just immersed me in a culture that I kind of was the genesis of as far as music, right? Because being a DJ at Magic City and all the top clubs, everybody came to me. I didn't have to go in the streets. The streets came to me. So I knew everybody before I even was an artist. I got there when Bobby Brown got there. I got there when LA and Babyface got there. I got there when all the people who have made Atlanta what it is, Deion Sanders, Dominique Wilkins, he always was there, but those cats made Atlanta what it was. And I like to think I'm a teeny weeny part of that because I was DJing all the clubs and I was the soundtrack of people's lives back then. I heard when you got the opportunity to DJ, people just gravitated to how you was putting things together and how you was throwing the sound yeah, out. I've always been professional and my upbringing in hip hop is a little bit different than everybody's because I was exposed to all forms of hip hop because I got the bright idea. Well, let me order records from the East Coast, down South. L.A., San Francisco, and I would order records from all the hood record stores so I knew what was going on in every hood as far as people dropping records because they probably press up about 500 records, give it to the record stores, and they would usually be white labels. They, a lot of them wouldn't even have anything on them or they just have the title on them. And I still have those records to this day, but being immersed in everybody's culture through music, like knowing that Queensbridge doesn't like Brooklyn and the Bronx and Brooklyn battle each other and Staten Island comes about and everybody's representing their borough. Same with down South, you know, Miami base, everybody's representing Miami base. But then when I moved to Atlanta, I got introduced to Atlanta Southern base and LA. I was in all that when NWA and all that first started because back in California, Back in the late 80s, Dr. Dre was doing up-tempo music because everything comes from Planet Rock. Everything comes from the up-tempo electronic music, craft work, you know, Dr. Dre surgery, Egyptian lover, right? All of those records were up-tempo in part. And coming down south, I knew I couldn't just keep making hip-hop, so I knew we had to make a bass record. And I went to Steve, I was like, hey, man. We got to make some up-tempo stuff. We ain't going to never get out of here. You know what I mean? And he was like, I can't make that bass stuff. But I was like, just do it your way. Just think Planet Rock, right? Egyptian love. And he put the beat together. 
I had the song already because Whoop There It Is was becoming a popular party chant in the clubs. And that was our first attempt at an up-tempo record. First time I played it. Played it at work on a Thursday night. And as soon as I dropped it in a cassette, because back then we'd go to the studio and get a cassette. <laughs> then I'd go play it at the club to see what it sounded like, see if I mixed it right and all that. Everybody started running to the DJ booth, and to this day is the biggest response on any record I've ever had, I've ever played in my DJing career. And I've been DJing for almost 40 years. So my hubris as a young man, I was like, I'm always going to make hit. I'm always going to have a hit. I'm always going to be fly. I'm always going to do this. So I kind of shelved that record. But then later on that year, one of the girls, Cherry, she was like, how come you don't play Whoop There It Is no more? And I was like, I'll play it. Played it. Same thing happened. And this time there was a record rep in the house uh, named Alan Cole. And Alan Cole took that record. He said, what is that? I was like, that's my new record. He's like, give me that record now. I'm taking it to New York because he worked for Columbia Records. He was a Southeast regional rep. And now I'm getting calls from Columbia Records. I'm like, this could work for every label. So now I'm giving it to all the labels. All the labels are popping to me. But back then it was just New York and L.A. And they didn't really know what to do with a bass record. So I almost gave up to this beautiful lady named Lisa McCall. I was like, you need to talk to Al Bell. And for those who don't know who Al Bell is, in the beginning of soul music, there were three labels, Philly International, Motown, Barry Gordy, and Stax Records, Al Bell, right? Fast forward, he put out a record the year before we did ours called Daisy Dukes by Deuce. And it went gold. So I was like, well, shoot, I can live with that. So I gave him a call and it took about two weeks to hit me back. And when he hit me back, I was like, look, dude, I got a hit record. I tested it. The whole city's blowing up on it. People asking for it. And I can't even give it to him. It's like, you really need to sign us right now. And he was like, OK. I was like, no, 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 don't play with me. You ain't even heard the record. I'll never forget these words. He was like, brother, I don't have to hear the record. I hear it in your spirit. Let's agree to agree. Get this thing moving. I was like, bet. I gave my two weeks in Magic City, signed a messed up record deal. And in a month and a half, tag team was platinum. The rest is history. Wow. So I read somewhere that DC was on fire from that song because you mentioned in the beginning that DC is in the house. Like everybody thought we was from D.C., so it blew up in D.C., right? Right. And then there's several pivotal moments. Ryan Cameron used to work at V103. He's a jock in Atlanta. And V103 didn't play rap, but he would take the instrumental and play it as a music bed when he made announcement. So people in the streets knew it, so they start calling and asking for it because everybody wanted that record. And we're the reason V103 started playing hip-hop in rotation. Then... Ed Lover was a good friend of mine because everybody had to come to Magic City. When they came to Magic City, they met me. They, they come straight to the DJ booth, especially artists. And Ed Lover was like, what was that? And I was like, that's my new record. He was like, money, give me that. And I was like, here you go. And he was like, man, I can't do nothing with no cassette because all I had was cassettes back then, right? And I said, when I get vinyl, we're going to hook it up. And he came down like a couple weeks after I left Magic City and I met him down at Magic City, gave him some vinyl. And that next Monday, he went back to New York got on Yo MTV Raps to play the Womp There It Is instrumental like Ryan Camera did. And it just blew. Everybody was like, what is that record? What is that beat? And then people started hearing that record. And then the real big pivotal one was the Bulls won their third championship. And I'm sitting on my couch in Atlanta, Georgia. And back then, there was only two cable channels, WGN and TBS. That's why everybody loves the Braves and the Cubs. And they had their third championship parade in Grant Park, 500,000 people. And now everybody's on stage chanting, whoop, there it is. And I'm listening to 500,000 people chant, whoop, there it is in Grant Park. Then we were out of here. I ain't stopped since. <laughs> I mean, I've had trials and tribulations and detours and whatnot, but that's life. I don't even, you know, when you're going through it, you can either look at the glass half empty or look at the glass half full. And I'm, I'm a person that looks at the glass half full and I take trauma, turn it into treasure. And anything bad happens to me, I vow that I will educate myself so it will never happen again. And exactly. that's where I sit, where I'm sitting. But I still got a ways to go. But, you know, it ain't nothing but work. And that's what I love about it. That's it. So when you say you had a messed up record deal, what was that about? I mean, every artist signs their first deal. 
and their first deal is not optimal for every artist. Think about how many records you've heard in your life and then how many artists are still making records, right? Not many, because it's about the deal. So we signed a non-optimal deal that didn't get us what we needed. And it just was a traumatizing experience because it stopped us in our tracks. And everybody goes through it. Now, we didn't get hit like a lot of people got hit because there's people that have never gotten paid. But because we wrote the song, we get writers royalties forever. But the other side of it is the sync fees and when people use it in a movie and people use it in commercials. And that's where we went wrong. So all this time, if it's in a movie or if it's in a commercial or whatnot, it's like, People ask, do you get paid? It's like very, very, very little because of the contract we signed. So it used to bother me for the first couple of years afterward, but then I take full responsibility as a grown man. You know what I'm saying? I signed that contract, so now you got to fix it. And I've spent 15 years fixing it because it was in a 15-year legal battle because it was two record companies fighting over the rights to whoop. There it is. So they were using us as pawns in the middle, but I was like, Y'all bloody each other up. But at the same time, I could have became an old, bitter rapper. But I basically was like, I'm going to get my day in court. You better figure this out. And I basically became a paralegal. Learn what emotion was. Learn what discovery was. Learn how trials come to fruition. Learn how to use Razor. Not Razor. Is it Razor? I think it's called Razor or Laser, which is the database of all court cases in the history of the United States. So now I can go look up case law of people who went through the same thing I went through, like Bismarcky and Vanilla Ice because of the sample. And now I can strategize and just figure out what happened, right? And we got our day in court and we prevailed. But, you know, it's always at a cost. So you go to war, you're going to come back with an eye patch, you're going to lose an arm, you're going to lose a leg. You know what I mean? You're going to be messed up in the head a little bit. It just depends. But you're still living and it's up to you to use life and ride it till the wheels fall off, right? So back then, I remember I was sitting in a movie theater, I think it was 2003, and I look up and I'm looking at Will Ferrell dance on the table to my song. And it made me mad, but I had to push that to the back of my mind because that doesn't serve me. But then I was like, you got a forever hit record because this is in a hit Christmas movie. It will be played every single year forever. It is up to you to go get your money. And that was my life's mission. You know what I'm saying? If Even if I'm not getting paid, I'm going to squeeze something out of that opportunity. And that's what I've done. And I got my skills together because I worked in the clubs. I was able to take lessons in learning voice. So I was able to use the club as a Petri disc for marketing and putting together business plans and making the business better. And being the fashion photographer, like I'm not just the DJ because I've been DJing forever. I'm your light guy. I'm your sound guy. I do your radio spots. I do your television commercials. I take pictures of the girls and get them in magazines. You got to hire 10 people to do what I do. And I try to tell people I come across that, you know, people love to complain and be the victim. But I'm like, if you got a job and you don't like your job, well, learn what everybody else does in the hierarchy of that organization. Maybe you can get to a higher level and you might like that job because of that organization. But if you don't be proactive, because that's what I would do. I learn everybody else's job. And if the boss comes in and be like, where's such and such? Man, I need to do it. I'll be like, I got it. I got you, boss. And what that does, most people be like, I ain't about to do all that extra work. But they don't understand what it is. When you learn somebody else's job and they tell you how to do that job, even if you get fired, even if you quit, You have just elevated yourself to the next level of your goals and dreams because you've got more skills in your toolbox to be better. To me, it's education. To me, it's put on game. It's seeking that knowledge. And that's what I do in every situation I do. I come across, I take one opportunity, I turn it into 10. And I got to say no to 80% of the stuff that comes my way just because I'm focused on the things that I'm doing now. So... I'm glad you didn't say no to me. Nah, man. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, I'm telling you, man, podcast for me, being a guest on a podcast serves 15 different purposes. I'm practicing articulation, practicing diction, practicing storytelling, 
I'm looking at you, making sure that you're not looking at your watch or you're not doing something else. I have you engaged. And the more I run my mouth, the more I come up with analogies, metaphors, because you're asking me questions and you want to know more. And we all are trying to solve people's problems. Right. Because that's my thing. You give what you want first. That's why I'm blessed. Because I'm not worried about the money. I'm not worried about none of that. I want to tell everybody. I've been telling people this for years. I said, I will be the guinea pig. I will go out there and learn it all. Because people, people just have a habit of wanting to be the victim. They don't teach us that. They ain't supposed to teach you that. And I will go be the guinea pig, learn what they know, bring it back to the street game, make the street game better. Now that I've told you, are you willing to put in the work? And I can tell you 99% of people ain't trying to put in all the work that I put in. And that's why I want it to be hard because I know everybody else ain't going to do it. I'm about to take a course that costs $7,000. And I am torn. But I'm like, I know these people know their thing. And I know if I take this, that $7,000 is a drop in a bucket to what it's going to net me. It's an investment in me. Right. But most people don't pull the trigger because one is they're scared Two, they kind of don't know and don't want to get beat out of money because there's so many profits. But these cats that I'm in masterminds with now, they know they stuff. And I know they know they stuff because they telling me I know my stuff. And now we tweaking like I'm masterful in SEO, I'm masterful in AI, masterful in marketing, masterful in all aspects of this. And I'm still trying to learn because, you know, people say, what do you want, DC? Because I ask people that all the time, what do you want? They can't tell me. So they try to, you know, the defense is, well, what do you want? And I'm like, I want mastery. Man, you ain't going to get mastery. All right, maybe I won't, but I'm going to be in the ballpark. If you're in the ballpark, you're getting paid. So that's my philosophy. That's what I do. I do that with every aspect of everything that I do from getting concerts, from being my own publicist, from being my own booking agent, from being my own everything, because I'm in organizations that I can go talk to somebody and they tell me how to do it. And being in an organization might cost you two, three hundred dollars a month, because in an organization, those people have been in that organization for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they love their profession and they can't wait to tell you about it. So I just join organizations and I try to tell people that. And once again, I've given you the game, but are you willing to put in the work? Are you willing to go to conference after conference and meet hundreds of people and get new circles of people that can help you get to the paper? And that's what I do. And then through SEO, all SEO is search engine optimization. The ability to get on the first page of Google is getting in front of the people who can pay you. What else is there? That's what I do. I get in front of the people who can pay me without them even knowing that I'm in front of them. I'm not running up to people say, hey, man, do this for me. Can you help me this? How do you do? No. I put myself in front of you where you say, wait a minute. What do I know him from? Because when I go to conferences, people don't even know who I am because of how I carry myself. And I befriend people just from my character. And because I was raised right and I know humanity because I've been a DJ all my life, right? So I know what not to do. I know how to talk to people. I have the gift of gab. I spit this game. So I can go to any room, white, black, indie, I don't care who they are. And I can draw them toward me. And then some way, somehow they'll find out who, they, that's the dude that's seen whoop, there it is. All bets are off now. I got you. And... Now I can get what I want, but I can help you too. So you're giving me your expertise and then I'm helping you. I'm out here running around figuring out AI. So here's the thing. People say, if I say AI, right, we start talking about AI, people are like, man, I'm going mess with that. That's the government. Ba boom, ba boom. They're going to be surveilling you and all this and all that and blah, blah. People think Terminator and they think, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, they think Will Smith, I robot. They think the world's going to end. And I'm like, so I really don't say AI when I want to convince people about AI. I just tell stories. I'm like, there's this dude who used to have to write websites. He couldn't write that well. But he started using this tool. And this tool helped him become the best writer he has ever been right now. There's also a cat that uses this tool who comes up with ideas for marketing and business. And now 
what used to take him six months to do takes him six days or six hours. And I tell all these stories about people who this tool's life have changed. And then I say, and all those people I just named to you are me. That's what it's done for me. And that's what gets them. And it's like, I've been more productive than I could have ever been in my life. There is nothing on this earth I don't believe I can't do. Because now I got tools to help me do it. And I put in the work, right? So whether it's getting concerts for tag team, whether it's getting a cut from people saying, man, do my website. I can't do, I'm not about to do your website, but I got some people that are rocky and it's going to cost you. But they're the best. Get a piece of that. Like there's all kinds of ways to get this money. And that's why I love what I do because I get to do a bunch of things a little bit. And then every blue moon, a commercial will come up, a TV show will come up where we do a performance. We perform, we got three NFL performances this year. Those are opportunities to do press releases and create the relevance, not to say, hey, everybody, look at me. What, look at what I'm doing. You create the relevance to get in front of the people that can pay you at your time and choosing. So when it comes where everybody starts looking for state fair, when it comes six months before state fair season, I pull something like that and then send everything out to all the state fairs. Now we're going to pull five state fairs for a year and they're the most lucrative shows that there are. We're on three tours right now. All this comes from SEO. All this comes from digital marketing. All this comes from me being my own publicist. Because once you learn something and you put in the work, now you get to be creative with it. And then what happens is our people don't realize that culturally they will never have what we have. So when we take what we have and put it to their game, only people that can do it is us. That in itself got me hyped, but I realized that a long time ago. And then this is what I want to leave people with because this makes you truly free. Don't nobody owe you nothing. Ain't nobody going to give you nothing. And don't nobody care. Once I realized that a long time ago, years ago, everything opened up for me. There are no excuses. There are no missed opportunities. You can correct everything as long as you breathe. But are you willing to put in the work? And that's what I talk about all the time. If you're not willing to put in the work, you're just wasting your time. That's what happens. And then what happens is life passes you by. And that takes years off of your life. Just that right there. But it ain't about money. It's about a fulfilling life. And people will, DC, you're lucky. You get to do this. Yeah, but that's not true. Because I'm a minnow compared to Taylor Swift or Beyonce. But I can SEO my way to Taylor Swift and Beyonce. You see what I'm saying? I can be in their orbit because I put in the work to be able to promote myself in that way. Example. Taylor Swift is in the same city. I, probably this year, we probably had shows with Taylor Swift in the same city. I could do a blog post about that experience, talk about how bad traffic was, talk about how I wish we could have opened up for her, rank that blog article, and make that news globally. Just because I wrote an article about Taylor Swift or Beyonce or Vanilla Ice or any other person, it's about putting in the work to come up with different combinations and figuring things out. And then you can have a course and make millions of dollars worth of course and teach everybody else. That's why people make so much money on courses, because they know that most people aren't going to implement what's in that course. They want it to be easy. Everybody wants to push a button. And now I've got what I want in life. Oh, you know, it don't work like that. So that's why I do a podcast every day, because I know that me sitting here running my mouth and telling people what I'm telling them. You might take one thing for me that changed your whole life. Because I've done that with other people. I might know 90% of everything I know, but that one little thing takes me up to 100%. So that's why y'all always listen. I just hustle. Right? That's right. I plant teams, play offense. I keep it moving, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. This didn't go the way so, you thought it was, did it? <laughs> I'm loving it. I'm oh, loving yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Loving. And that's why I love doing them because people think we're going to talk about tour bus stories. That's just like, we ain't talking about music. We talk about this hustle. We talk about the game. Right. Because everybody has a pain point. And I spend my time trying to answer people's pain points and give them solutions. 
That's all I do is try to give people solutions and come up with solutions to problems. So that's why I say, don't hang around negative people. They'll bring you down. I'm like, well, if the people you love most are the most negative, better figure it out. And I love that because if you're negative to me, I don't react like, man, you don't know what you're talking about. I take the approach. What if what they were saying is right? What would I do about it? That in itself is a solution. Now, they might not know what they're talking about, but I do the exercise because now I have a solution to put in my toolbox of life. So I have reference to it. Or if somebody comes to me complaining about whatever, I make a solution. I ask them what they want. Then I give them a solution. Or if somebody comes with an excuse, man, you can't do this because of this, this, this. Oh, really? Okay. In that case, all I can do is be the example. I ain't about to talk about it. I'm just about to show you. And I'm not even going to have to say it when it happened because you're going to look me in my eye and know that you didn't know what he was talking about. You don't want it with me because I'm going to figure it out, period. So I take that approach to everything. And trust me, all the stuff I'm talking is way easier said than done. But I've been shucking peas and stemming collard greens since I was five years old. My parents worked me and my brother like a dog. You know what I'm saying? So as a grown man, I have never not known work. I had a paper route. I hustled it, raking leaves and shoveling snow. And I've had a job since I was eight years old. So I've never not known work. So for me, work is nothing. If you want what you want, okay, let's get to work. Because the quicker you get to work, the quicker you get to where you want to be. It might take a lifetime. But that sometimes is what it takes. You know? I mean. I ain't the smartest dude <laughs> or I wouldn't have signed a messed up record contract. You know what I'm saying? So when you're young, you do things like that and they have long lasting effects, but either you can let that be your legacy and it break you down or you can fight and educate yourself in a way where you're glad that that happened to you because you might not be where you are. If that didn't happen to you, you might not be on this level of all kind of different things pairing for a Ted talk about to speak at Harvard and MIT about AI. What? I might not even be on this level if I don't sign a messed up record contract. And that's why when you have traumatic events that happen in your life, you have to vow to yourself that it'll never happen again. And you got to learn how to make that not happen again. And it's hard. I ain't saying none of this is easy. It is the hardest thing I've ever had to do until I do it. And then it's on to the next hardest thing that I've ever had to do until I do it. So, you know, right now I'm having fun. We're touring, gone every weekend. Got a couple weeks off now, but we're getting ready for football season and NBA season. We do halftime shows. We just finished state fair, state fair season. Now we're about to hit the casinos and do, you know, we just, you got to know something if you have a career, a 30 year career on one song. This is 30 years. There is came out in 1993. This is 30 years. And I'm still Check here. this out. Check this out. I read something about a group called 95 South, right? Yeah. They had a woot. There it is. Yeah. And it kind of got upset with you guys. But at the end of the day, I don't know those guys. So I played the song like the other day, Google it. Everybody and like, I've heard that song. And it's crazy because they weren't the only ones. Woot, there it is, was a party saying. Nobody right. invented it, right? Somebody did, but don't nobody know who. Somebody heard it from somebody else. They heard it from somebody. but. To say that it was stolen, you can't do that because every club in the South was, everybody was rocking it. Plus, at that time, there was four other Woomp There It Is records. People don't know about it. Everybody was trying to do a Woomp There It Is record back then. But because of who I was and where I was, I had people who would take it to different regions and play it. And then Al Bell is old school. He's old school music industry. He knew what to do with a hit record. And he put the money behind it and he blew it up. And everybody else stayed regional and we went global. It was over before it started, but people want to, I'm not saying they want to bring it up in a negative way, but you read things like that and people sometimes feel a certain type of way. And that's fine, man. That's fine because everybody know the truth. Everybody in Atlanta know the truth. And hey man, it was just a song. Everybody thinks it was just like this Manhattan project where we was building a nuclear bomb. It wasn't nothing like that. It was just a song about dudes having fun on a Friday night, chasing women, drinking. 
like every country song, like every rock and roll song, like every blues song. That's what the foundation of music. Men chasing women drinking. So, and I'm cool with everybody. I don't even allow that stuff to get riled up. And it's just like, I'm still here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That guy means something. The crazy part about Woke, there it is. The longevity mm-hmm. of the song, man, and it keeps just, keeps going after all these years. I got a nine-year-old grandson that knows mm-hmm. the song and can yeah. rap it and everything. He knows the lyrics yeah. to the song. But it's you know crazy. Why? See, here's the things that people don't know. That Whoop There It Is has been regurgitated to every aspect of culture, every aspect of life. Example, 1994, we did a record with Disney called Womp There It Is, where I taught Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse how to rap. And now that record lives forever because parents will buy that record for their children. And then their children learn what Womp There It Is is because it's number one on the track. We were the first song on Jock Jam's first, the first issue. Every stadium around the world, every arena around the world, every High school, everybody that played music and sports had Jock Jams Volume 1, and we were the first song on the Jock Jams. Then you get to the 2000s, and then you got Go Noodle, and you got a, what's the other one? It's it's like kids. These kids, they redid it as a kid's record, and then they did a video to it. And then for the preschoolers, when they want to put them down, they wear them out with Wound There It Is, kids' version. But then for the first graders, second graders, they let them hear it. If they're good on Fridays and they sit there, they party on and have snacks to whoop, there it is. People sent me videos on this, man. (laughs) And all this stuff was licensed. And that has been going on since 2000 and it's still going. All these kids are still looking at that. So fast forward to the Geico commercial. When a parent is looking at that Geico commercial and their kid is looking at that Geico commercial and their kid is like, what you know about this? And they're like, what you know about this? That's why. Because kids have been bought up to whom there it is, and parents remember it from partying. So old meets new, and now they get to see who we are in a Geico commercial. That's the biggest Geico commercial there ever was, according to Geico. I was like, you tripping? I said, bigger than the caveman? He's like, yep. It's like, bigger than hump day? It's like, yep. I'm like, wow. So wow. I, I, you know, I was trying to get more, com- I was like, I'm not going to do commercials for a while, because just like whom there it is, there's no way we'll ever make another whom there it is. People say, why don't y'all do new music? Because I've got a forever hit record. Why would I? Plus, that time has passed. I do music again, but I'll do it in a different way. And with the commercial stuff, there's ways to do it, but you got a little little time passed. But then I'm milking it because everywhere we go, we did a minor league baseball game Saturday in Scranton. And they put us in the concourse. And we was there the whole game signing autographs. There was 150 people in line the whole game waiting for an autograph for us. And the thing that was said the most, I love that commercial. I love you guys so much. Because that commercial came during the pandemic when everybody was at their wits end. You know what I'm saying? And everything was political and everything was COVID and people was lying and then just cut through everything and bought people joy in a sea of sorrow. And I hear stories every day. You know, my daddy had COVID and that used to just bring him joy. And he hung on. Every time he heard that record, he'd just be happy. And those were my baby's first words. Somebody sent me a, a video. Every time that commercial come on, the dog go crazy. How's that possible? So I'm humble enough and more mature enough now to say, how can I take this opportunity and turn it into 50? And that's what I've done. So I don't need to do another commercial until I want to do another commercial. Plus, I'm an actor. I've been in movies and television. I've had a good time. But right now, my focus is AI and digital marketing because I'm not letting life pass me by. And I watched that happen to my father. My father has a doctorate degree. He was dean of University of Colorado Ethnic Studies. He retired in like 2000. And he never learned how to use a computer. And I know he'd still be here today if he could just type into a computer and get some information, like we all do, that we take for granted. But he realized it when he was like 
I want one of them iPhones. I was like, all right, if you don't know how to use a computer, you're going to be short on the iPhone. Because all that iPhone is a computer. So to watch that and understand what that was, because it happened to me. Because when vinyl started fading out and all these DJs start DJing with CDJs, I was like, I'm old school. I never DJ with no CDs. Y'all got me messed up. And all these young cats started with me. And I had to catch up real quick. And I vowed then I will never do that again. But in the process of learning things, things do pass you by because when things are bad, sometimes that's the time you pull the trigger. You know, the housing crisis, that's when you buy a house because they're so cheap. It's always going to go back up, but you don't realize that till a little bit later in life. So when these new technologies come out, I'm not going to be behind. And I'm going to take these new technologies, learn what they know, put the street game to it, and try to teach everybody. And show everybody there is a way. All I can do is be the example. So when people see me on a TED Talk or when people see me on 60 Minutes or people see me do something, because that's what I plan on doing. Those are my goals, to be on that level. Then I will have made the whole game better. But it's always going to go back to, are you willing to put in the work? And most people aren't. So that's why we struggle. You got to get that grind. You got the grind, man. I love hustle. I ain't had no woman in so long because the hustle is my woman. I kill for my boo, boy. That's my hustle is my woman for real. I love her to death for real. So, mm mm. Till I reach my, you know, I have high goals, and like I said, I've had to fight. I've had to fight, not stereotypes. I had to fight through myself. I had to fight through all my bad habits, fight through all my misconceptions and fight through all the things that kept me back. Because the only thing that holds you back is you, especially now. Well, what about your environment? Well, in your environment, you got a cell phone, don't you? Yeah. Well, if you just keep typing in how to, how do I? How do I do this? You're going to get an answer for it. But are you willing to put in the work? The whole point. You don't need no money. Put in the work. Educate yourself. People go into a bank all the time. Can I get a loan? So that's the equivalent of a crackhead coming to me saying, hey, man, let me get a loan. I'm going to pay you back. You already know that you ain't going to give him no money when he walk up on you. That's how banks see people. So if you don't go in with your stuff together, with a business plan, with projections, if you don't go in to where they say, you know what? This might work. You're going to always fail. And then you're going to get mad and then you're going to make excuses, man. They just did that because I'm black. Nah, man. That ain't the reason. <laughs> you can think that's the reason all you want. I said, man, because you black, the world is yours. That's how I look at it. Because I'm black, there ain't nothing I can't do. That's how I feel. I don't care what nobody say. And part of it is certain things you got to be quiet about. Certain things you got to shut up. And you can get your money. But if you do it and you rah-rah about it, somebody going to be like, well, why he got it and I don't? Well, why are they getting it and I'm not getting it? As soon as I get into Congress, I'm going to make a law to where it makes that hard for them. Everybody be mad at the government. And I'm like, the government is making them laws for somebody. You need to figure out who they're making them for. Adjust your hustle and then get the benefits of that law. Not when I mean, the government's against me. And my favorite one is just the conspiracy. Man, the government going to put chips in us. They're going to do this. And the, the retina scam, man, I ain't doing none of that stuff. It's like, you do it already, dude. I said, you got TSA pre? Yeah. Do you got clear? Yeah. You got Delta Digital? Yeah. Two of those got retina scans. One of them got a, a finger scan. Got your whole fingerprints. And then TSA pre can jump into all the database to see what your background is. So they know everything about you already. People don't even see how simple that is. They want to make it so complex. And I'm like, you go to clear and they say eyes or finger. And you look into it, clear, boom, you walk because you want convenience. You want those comforts. Are you willing to sacrifice your comforts for, but you're not going to travel unless they know who you are. But everybody wants to blame the government. Everybody wants to say, hey, they don't teach us that. I'm different, man. I really am. And when I explain it that way to people, they understand what I'm saying. The only thing stopping you is you. That's it. This is you being authentic. You're your own authentic self. Yeah, man. You know, and that's what they teach you in acting. You are enough. 
all your experiences, everything you've been through is special. You are enough. Like, man, you're wound there. You know, like I was telling you, the wound there, you're wound there it is. You get to do this. Yeah, no, I don't. I get discriminated against every single day because I got one song and don't have a whole catalog of five albums. So I don't figure out a way to get past it. Because it's like, everybody's like, man, you got to do social media this. When I try to help people, you got, you don't do social media. I do it in a different way. And I don't need what everybody else needs. First of all, I don't need the attention. And my philosophy is I don't need 100,000 people to like me. I just need 100 people to pay me. Life is that simple for me. That's all it is for me. So what can I do to get 100 people to pay me? Well, you target them. You're strategic. You get in front of the people who can pay you with the services you offer, with the talent that you have, or with what you can do for them, or what you can learn from them. That's how I became a good actor in Atlanta. Got in front of all the casting directors, got in front of all the coaches. I took every class from every coach. Then left them a Google review. Now everybody sees that I went to that class, so they call me saying, DC, is that coach good? Yeah, you need to go mess with him. She got me on point. I've created my own relevance. Now other acting coaches say, hey, man, can you leave me a, a review? Because I'm bringing people money. Same with casting directors. Casting directors, they're the ones that pick people for movies. So if somebody gets greenlit in L.A., they're looking for a casting director in Atlanta, and they pull up somebody and they see their Google reviews, I'm first because I know SEO and I know how to optimize my picture to where it sticks at the top forever. Come on, man. This is hustle. All it is is hustle, thinking differently, figuring things out, coming up with a new way because everybody's following each other, which is great for me because I ain't following nobody. I'm trying to come up with a new way to do something because there's always a new way. That's why it's called an invention. That's why it's called innovation. There's always a new way. There's always a way that somebody didn't think about. Every artist's success story is different. Everyone is different. And most people think they know how people got put on and it's totally different for what happened. So that just lets me know that there's nothing I can't do because I'm going to figure out five different ways to do it differently. I'm going to test them. And then if it don't happen, I'm not emotionally tied to it because I just plant seeds. And what happens is I tell people, you don't plant seed, plant a seed and sit down Indian style and look at the seed. Be like, all right, seed grow. Man, the seed ain't growing, y'all. Man, this seed sucks. I quit. I mean, people we know like that. Took a real estate course. Like, I'm about to be rich. You see them six months later. We're having a real estate course. Well, you know, it wasn't for me because you plant them seeds and you keep it moving. I'm in the business of planting seeds. I planted a seed called Whoop. There it is 30 years ago. And now it is a sequoia. It ain't going nowhere. And that's what I've done. And they come back and hit you in the head. You don't know how they're going to grow. And sometimes in life, you're just not ready, but it comes back. And you'd be like, wait a minute, I can revisit this now. So to me, there's just no excuses. There are limits, but there are no excuses and there are no missed opportunities. So I don't buy it, man. I don't buy it. And a lot of this is a pep talk for me, but since we've been talking, I don't come up with 10 more hustles just from talking to you. That's why I do these. It makes me better. And it's just win-win for everybody. Now, there's going to be people who are skeptical. But, hey, man, it ain't for everybody. It's not. How many times have you heard it? If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> it's not easy. Very difficult. It's gut-wrenching. But, you know, I mean, I could take it. I got thick skin. That comes from years of experience. And that's why I tell these old cats to be hating on the young cats. Like, why don't you learn what they know? Because you got something they'll never have, which is experience. But if you keep hating on them, you just sound like an old bitter dude and ain't nobody going to mess with you. You look crazy. And that's what happened. I embrace everybody. Even if they don't know what they're talking about. Because there's clues in that negativity. There's nuggets of wisdom in that negativity. Always. That's where it's hidden. That's where the most positive stuff is hidden in the negativity. People don't see it that way. People want to be in their feelings about it. And I be in my feelings about stuff, but I don't react. I keep it inside. And then what eventually happens, five, ten minutes, it goes away or it turns into positive energy because I get an idea from that negativity that catapults my game to a whole nother level. Just about using all these tools that life give you, man. And I'm just good at it. 
and I'm writing books. I'm doing all kinds of stuff, man. So I'm having a good time, man. And I'm about to get on this mastermind in the next couple minutes and help some more people. Because batting up, you know, throwing back ideas back and forth, you get more ideas. So I've been blessed. I appreciate all the love that people have given Wump There It Is and given me over the years. And it's been my honor to rock people's houses, make a song that people will enjoy forever and make them smile. And my biggest honor is just making the city of Atlanta dance for 30 years because I was rocking them clubs, boy. So I want to thank you for letting me come on here and run my mouth because that's what I do. And hopefully your people got some wisdom out of it. And people are like, well, how to contact you? Well, all you do is type in tag team. Whoop, there it is, DC Glenn, because I do SEO. I can be found. Get in front okay. of people who can pay. Get in front of the people who need your services. Get in front of the people you can help. So that's how this goes. Okay, I got one more thing for you. No problem. What would you say to the younger generation that's trying to get into the music industry? And what are some of the do's and don'ts? Because a lot of them are trying to do it. It's funny because I get calls every day of, Hey man, can I be on your agency? Can you put me in the game? And I'm like, my agency is for tag team. I just run my own agency, but I'm not doing that. I'm not messing with no artists. I'm not, that's not my game. But what are you trying to do? And they're like, well, I want to sing for you. No, you ain't doing that. What do you want to do? First, you got to know what you want to do. Then if somebody who got a hit record and still doing it after 30 years, give you some advice, you need to take it and do whatever you can to implement that in your game no matter how weird because you know nothing at this point all you know is what you see on tv a person being a star so i say okay i'm not about to waste my time with people i said all right what you trying to do and they tell me i said well i'm gonna give me your email i'm gonna send you some homework and when you finish this homework hit me back and they never call me back so for me if i had to tell people to learn something get part of an organization that can explain to you how to run a business once you start learning how to run a business, you'll know how to run your own music business. Once you learn the music business, then start reading some books or go get a YouTube video and learn about music publishing. You learn about music publishing inside and out. Look at every video on YouTube about music publishing. You do that, it's going to be real hard to take advantage of you in the music industry. That's the only piece of advice I got for anybody because they're about, don't I got to go to the clubs? Don't I got to get a bunch of women? Don't I got to do this? Don't I got to be, don't I got to get my sound right? Don't I got to get this? I was like, dude, all that's a moot point. If you sign a messed up contract, I said, you can have a mediocre record. And if you know music publishing, that record can last forever because you can license into movies, commercials. You know what I'm saying? You can eat off that record forever, but you got to know music publishing before you jump in because you got to know what your rights are. I can tell you this because I went through this. So if I had no music publishing, whole different ball game. Whole different ball game. My life might have been different. So I take responsibility for every mistake that I've made. And all you young people, don't let life get too far by you without taking responsibility for the mistakes you make. Because when you take responsibility for the mistakes you make, that allows you to move forward to the next mistake you're going to make but you won't make them same mistakes again. And it's okay to make mistakes. That's what it is. You can, don't everything work the first time. You know what I'm saying? The first time you cook some ribs, it ain't going to work the first time. You can follow that recipe to the T. Third, fourth time, hey, man, it's kind of, hey, okay. You might not know how the meat works. You might not know what seasonings to put in the barbecue sauce. You might not know the smoking process. You might not know all these things. But you think you're just supposed to throw a slab of ribs on the grill and it's going to come out like the best ribs ever? No, nah, it don't work like that. Learn music publishing if you want to get in the game. You do that. There's tons of stuff out there about it. Get a book and read it. Mark it up so you know what to look for. Learn the language of the music industry. That's how I got good at finance. I learned the language. That's how I get good at every genre of thing I go into. I learn the language first. Now I don't know what they're talking about. I had to do that working with the legal situation. What are they talking about? Let me go look up these words. Let me fit. You got a phone that you can say, what does this mean? Or what this mean? <laughs> However you want to say it. And it will give you an answer. 
There's no excuse, man. So that's my advice to young people trying to get in the music industry. There you have it. DC Glenn, brother, I appreciate you taking the time to stop by today. It's been fun. I appreciate you too, man. Y'all take care. Peace. Thank you for tuning in to Real Talk Resident D. If you enjoyed the show, please share with anyone that you feel that need to take this journey with us on being a better you. See you next time.